Welcome to the seminar series on Sewer and Pipeline Engineering. My name is Bert Bossler and I am the Scientific Director of the IKT, Institute for Underground Infrastructure. In this seminar session, we will deal with an important subtopic from the field of rehabilitation, and that is bonding and surface preparation. To do this, I would like to proceed in three steps. First, we ask ourselves what the task of a surface preparation is. Then we look at experiences from the field of repair and renovation. Finally, I would like to talk specifically about manhole coating, where surface preparation is also of great importance. Let's start with the tasks of surface preparation. Here we see different tasks that can be fulfilled with the use of high pressure water jets. Basically, you can treat a material with water jets in many different ways. Water jets can be used to slit, cut, drill or even split the material. In the context of surface or substrate preparation, high pressure water jets are generally used with three objectives. Number one, cleaning. That means removing dirt or dirty material. Number two, roughening. That means the surface is roughened so that it can interlock well with a mortar or a resin that is applied for rehabilitation. Number three, removal. That means removing as much material from the damaged surface until only undamaged material remains. Not all three tasks can always be accomplished. It depends on the condition of the substrate, with which pressures and with which preparation targets one has to work. Let's now take a look at which rehabilitation methods require special surface preparation and how a good bond affects the load-bearing capacity of the rehabilitation systems. The first example concerns the repair of main sewers. We have already examined these methods in a comprehensive IKT product test and most of the methods also scored quite well. Two particularly interesting methods were the inner sleeves and the short liner methods. In our system tests and also on the construction site, it became apparent that especially with these methods, the surface preparation is particularly important for the rehabilitation quality. Here we see both methods in use during our product test. Above, we see the inner sleeve surrounded by an elastomeric sheath. The sealing studs must be pressed against the old pipe in order to seal the damaged section securely. Here it is clear that the surface must be thoroughly cleaned so that the sealing ring can also develop a sealing effect. Below we see the shortliner method. The glass fiber mat is impregnated with a resin that is supposed to bond securely with the old sewer later on. This can only succeed if the surface is clean and load-bearing and if the resin can interlock well with the substrate. This means that the surface must be removed, cleaned and roughened beforehand. In comparative tests we have investigated how important the surface preparation is for the rehabilitation success. This graph shows the results of adhesive tensile tests on short liners for different preparations and different resin products. In all cases a vitrified clay pipe was rehabilitated. And in all cases here the glaze of the clay pipe had not been removed beforehand. We can see that products 1 and 2 failed completely and had almost no adhesive tensile strength, even with a clean and dry surface. The other two products, number 3 and 4, on the other hand, showed measurable bonding behavior in all cases. However, the required minimum value of 1.5 MPa was exceeded only in a few cases. A major conclusion from these tests was that in vitrified clay pipes the glaze should be removed before rehabilitation with short liner, for example by milling it off. This was confirmed in a second series of tests. Here the bond of short liners to unglazed clay pipe surfaces was tested. We see in almost all cases that the required minimum values were achieved. Only in one case did, it, did a lower value appear with a grease-wet surface. Overall it was therefore recommended that the glaze in vitrified clay pipes 
should be removed and that the surface should be cleaned of any grease before shortliner rehabilitation. And a good bond between the shortliner and the old pipe can then also significantly improve the load-bearing capacity of an already cracked vitrified clay pipe. Here we see pictures from crown pressure tests on vitrified clay pipes for house connection lines. A crack had been milled into these vitrified clay pipes to simulate a pipe damage. The upper picture shows the unrepaired cracked vitrified clay pipe. The remaining load-bearing capacity was about 28 kN per meter. An uncracked pipe would have been able to carry a load of well over 50 kN per meter. In the second row we see the deformation process of a pipe rehabilitated with a short liner where there is no good bond between the short liner and the vitrified clay pipe. The maximum load here is similar to the unrefurbished pipe, it is 25 kN per meter. We can clearly see that there is a gap between the short liner and the clay pipe, which allows the short liner to slide past the clay pipe surface. In consequence, the liner does not make any contribution to load bearing. In the bottom row, we see another cracked vitrified clay pipe, but this time rehabilitated with a short liner with a very good bond. Even in the fractured state, the short liner still lies tightly against the clay pipe in large areas and does not slide. And the already existing crack was safely bridged by the short liner. As a result, a very high maximum load of 75 kN per meter was measured which was even higher than the maximum load of a new vitrified clay pipe. So the short liner not only bridged the crack, but also strengthened the wall and thereby provided a higher stiffness and a higher breaking load. Now you might think that good bonding is always a good thing, but here you have to be careful because bonding can also stiffen a system excessively and that leads to problems when it is flexibility that is actually needed. I would like to illustrate this with another example. We see here a test setup in my institute, the IKT. In this setup, rehabilitation methods for house connection pipes were tested. We see here a layer with six connection pipelines that lead to a main sewer in the rear area of the test stand. All connection pipes were prepared with damage scenarios and were then to be rehabilitated with various pipeliner products. What we see here is the bottom layer. This was covered with soil and then five more layers were installed above it, each again with six lines. So in total, six times six, that is 36 pipelines, were installed for rehabilitation. The lowest layer, which we can see here, was grounded to a depth of about five meters in the test stand. After the rehabilitation, the test stand was filled with water to simulate a rise in groundwater. Basically, we were prepared for three failure mechanisms of the liners. Number one, we anticipated that individual liners would buckle under the external pressure. Number two, we also anticipated that some liners may have a leaking wall, allowing water to infiltrate through the wall. And finally, number three, possibly water is flowing through the annular space between the liner and the old pipe all the way to the main sewer and infiltrating the system again. Well, what was the result? Quite simply, none of these things, of those things we expected, happened. But instead, something completely different occurred. In this picture we see typical damage patterns appearing in the liners after the groundwater level was raised. Regardless of the product, cracks appeared at some of the socket joints that lay in front of or behind bands. The outer water then flowed through these cracks back into the connection line. That was quite surprising because immediately after rehabilitation, the liners had all been classified as tight in a pressure test. Obviously, the rise of groundwater has caused a strain on the liner in the area of the old pipe's joint. But what exactly had happened here? We can see some of it on this picture. 
all the liners had been glued to the old pipe. That is, no pre-liner was used, so the resin was in direct contact with the old pipe and could also leak out through leaking pipe joints, as we can see here. The bonding was useful, of course, in the sense that the liner was better protected against buckling and the flow of water in the annular space was also stopped. As I said before, these were two failure mechanisms that we had worried about. However, the good bond leads to yet another problem, and that is when groundwater level rises and both the pipeline and the soil are subjected to buoyancy. When the soil is relieved, it pushes upwards, forcing the pipe joints of the old pipes to open, especially in vertical bands. If the liner has no bond, it can easily slide over these deformations. If the liner, however, is well bonded, such sliding is not possible. Then the liner must completely stretch over the increasing gaps in the joint, and this ultimately leads to overstretching and cracking of the liner. The whole thing gets even worse when the liner resin, as in these pictures, penetrates into the joint or even into the soil. Then the constraining stresses in the liner increase even more when the, when the old pipe moves. All in all, it becomes clear, bonding can be a problem when it is flexibility and sliding ability that is actually needed. In this case, to optimize the liner, it means that the initial bond should fail and the liner should slide before the liner wall cracks due to overstretching. In further experiments, we then investigated which geometric areas are particularly susceptible to such phenomena under buoyancy. Here we see a test setup with the accompanying FEM calculation model. Of particular concern are connection areas to the manholes or also vertical changes in the pipeline itself. If the soil rises due to buoyancy, then it is here where major displacements can occur and can put excessive stress on the liner. Against this background, test methods have already been used for liners to confirm precisely the ability of the liner to detach under bending when bridging cracks. In this picture we see that the liner has detached from the old pipe wall in the lower area at the moment of crack widening. This allows it to bridge the crack with a greater length of liner than would be the case with a complete bond. The strains are then of course lower and the liner does not crack but remains tight. So much for the topic of bonding in pipeline repair and renovation. Now let's move on to manhole renovation and here to manhole coating. We have investigated the topic of manhole rehabilitation in numerous IKT research projects and IKT product tests. Here we see pictures from a test program in which pre-damaged manholes were set up in our large-scale test stand and then they were rehabilitated using various coating methods. Both mortar coatings and plastic coatings were used. If these coatings are under external water pressure after rehabilitation, they must withstand this pressure permanently. In addition, cracks are to be bridged and also the structural integrity of the manhole should be restored. To achieve all this, good surface preparation is necessary. Here we see pictures from the manhole renovation. Mortar and plastic coatings can be applied by hand or they can also be spun or sprayed on with automatic equipment. Of great importance, however, is the prior surface preparation. Simple cleaning with a high-pressure lens, as shown here on the right, is only effective in removing dirt or grease. Removing of defective substrate and roughening the surface is hardly possible. Therefore, automatic cleaning processes are used for this purpose. In the picture below, in the middle, we see rotating nozzles that blast the surface evenly. Some techniques can also add sand or other grains to the water jet to further improve the removal effect. If there were errors in the surface preparation, considerable damage can occur to the coatings. Plastic coatings in particular are very sensitive here. On the left we see how the groundwater penetrating from the outside has created large blisters. 
If the adhesive tension between the coating and the substrate is not sufficient to hold the blister, the blister continuously grows larger and larger. On the right we see when the coating itself can no longer hold the stresses in the blister. The coating then cracks and the groundwater can enter the manhole again. The problem of blister formation can also be described geometrically. In this picture we see that the water pressure P acts on the entire blister surface. This creates a detachment force that has to be held by the adhesive tensile stresses around the circumference of the blister. The tricky thing is that as the blister diameter increases, the detachment force increases in a square law fashion while the holding forces at the edge of the blister increase only in a linear fashion. In other words, there is a critical blister size at which the force from the water pressure can no longer be held. The blister then enlarges abruptly, that means the entire coating detaches from the substrate as we have just seen on the last slide with the orange coating. The whole thing can also be described mathematically. The pressure on the blister can be maintained as long as the pressure times the circular area of the blister is smaller than the force from the triangular adhesive tension over the entire circumference of the blister. Above we see the corresponding equations and there the maximum diameter can also be calculated. In the graphic we can see the relationship again clearly. The blister diameter D is plotted on the horizontal axis on the vertical axis we see the force. The solid line represents the holding force at the circumference of the blister. This increases linearly because the circumference of the circle is proportional to its diameter. The dashed red line represents the detachment force due to the water pressure. Like the area of the circle, this force increases by the square of the diameter of the blister. The crucial point is the intersection of the two curves, up to which point the force from water pressure can still be absorbed by the circumferential stresses. If the blister becomes larger, however, in this case larger than 200 mm, the coating detaches completely from the wall. A second important aspect besides adhesion under external water pressure is crack bridging. Manhole coatings can, similar to short liners, restore the stability of a cracked concrete manhole ring. This is shown in this picture. Above we see the condition after rehabilitation. The crack has been completely bridged by the coating and there is a good bond between the coating and the substrate, so sliding is not possible. Below we see what happens when the manhole ring is loaded. Because of the additional layer of coating, the ring bears with a higher wall thickness than before the rehabilitation. And in the crack area, only the area of the coating can stretch. In the case of small cracks, this means very small strains and therefore a high stiffness of the entire system. We were also able to confirm this behavior in our tests. Both plastic and mortar coatings restore the stability of the ring. And mortar coatings even increase the stability, as the manhole wall is structurally enhanced. However, a prerequisite for this contribution to the load-bearing behavior is a very good bond between the coating and the substrate. And this brings me to the end of this presentation. Surface preparation is to clean, to remove and to roughen the substrate. A good bond is very important for some repair and renovation processes. However, bonding can also reduce flexibility. Whether this can be a problem must be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Manhole coatings also require good substrate preparation. This is especially important for plastic coatings under external water pressure. And all coatings that contribute to crack bridging can improve the load-bearing behavior of pipelines and manholes. Thank you.